Okay, so um, of course we're complete IT whizzes. Clearly, that's that's happening. Um, <laughs> We are not good at IT, but what this group is phenomenal at is helping women that are going through COVID and are pregnant, people that are about to have babies or early postpartum. Um, when this all, we all kind of got slapped in the face, this was obviously a huge need. So I'm so uh, grateful to this whole group that that just came together very quickly because when childbirth classes were dropped, when um, the contact was dropped with your support system, um, it was a huge need immediately. So um, we created a, um, God, how many modules are there, Annie? 13? 13, 13 modules of from uh, breastfeeding to postpartum exercise to, um, I'm, I'm not gonna do it justice saying, all that, but there's doulas, there's midwives, there's um, herbalists, nutritionists, there's pelvic floor PTs. Um, there's so many different experts in this group that you, you should feel like a huge warm hug from all of these people because there's whatever you need, this group I am, pretty darn confident that that you can get it from from this group so um, I'm gonna give everybody um, just a, a brief second to sort of say hi introduce themselves and um, we are we have questions that were already asked to us and we will be monitoring our Facebook sites to see if you have any other questions since we had to shift and go to YouTube instead of Facebook so um, I how about um, uh, let's have, let's have about Taylor. I'm looking at my screen here. So it's like, um, yeah, Taylor, why don't you go and then I'll just, I'll just direct it through. Great. Thanks, Kristen. I am Taylor Davis and I'm a birth doula and a childbirth educator as well as a doula trainer. And yeah, I'm excited to be here and working with all of you and ready to answer some questions and offer some support. Um, there are, and how about, so who, who else are our doulas? Why don't we start with that? Um, so Darcy? Yes, hi, my name is Darcy Sowers from Dover Doula. I am a postpartum doula, a lactation counselor, and a prenatal yoga teacher. Is that so, it? That's all. Oh, okay. <laughs> also a birth nerd, as I mentioned, so. <laughs> is that well, a thing, a birth nerd? <laughs> There's a hashtag. You're one, Kristen. <laughs> I'm so excited. I I'm definitely a nerd of anything. So, um, okay. And Krista, you're like doula, doula trainer. I am. So, um, hi everyone. I'm Krista Malte. I am an advanced postpartum doula, postpartum doula trainer, an advanced lactation counselor, and I'm the owner of Relief Parenting in Hampton, New Hampshire. Awesome. Um, and Alicia. Yes, hi, uh, Alicia Sattel. I am a birth and postpartum doula and a birth assistant and a childbirth educator. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. And Morgan? No. You... Hi. Yeah, oh, yeah. I yeah, am ahead. a community home birth midwife and owner of Flourish Midwifery, and I'm happy to be here. Awesome. And Annie? I must leave me. I'm Annie Hopkins. I'm a pelvic health physical therapist who specializes in birth and postpartum at Oceanside PT. Yes, and I own Oceanside Physical Therapy, and um, we specialize in pelvic health, um, but um, treat all sorts of people who have any sort of pelvic dysfunction, which is a lot of people. So that is our specialty. Um, Okay, so we have been hearing many, many questions. Obviously this world is freaky and scary and nobody knows when it's gonna end. So uh, the fears have gone from um, short-term strategies to long-term strategies. So um, I think some of the first questions we're hearing is that fear around support and how do I get my support system? and uh, dual is specifically, can I still work with my doula? How, how do I do that? So um, I'm going to start off with the doulas answering what adaptations have you all um, figured out and how have you um, managed to um, continue to support 
people at this time. Do you want me to start? <laughs> Yeah. Go for um, it. I'll say Go. a little bit. Sure. Um, as as primarily a birth doula, um, there's been a lot of conversations in the doula community about how can we keep supporting our families. As most of you might know, mo you know, most hospitals are not allowing doulas to come in now, um, with the caveat that Wentworth Douglas in our local area is still. And my answer to the question is yes, you can still get support from a doula. Doula support is wonderful at your birth, at your place of birth, but it's also so much more than that. I always tell people, even before this all happened, that so much of you get so much of what you get when you work with a doula is prenatal care, support during your prenatal period, postpartum care, even from afar, if we can't be in your home. So yes, you can still work with a doula. I think doulas are even more needed right now as people are kind of navigating fear and just lots of you know policy changes and things like that so it's kind of my general answer but i'll give the rest of the doulas a chance to share what they think too I and know i would say oh go ahead Krista. yeah go ahead no go ahead hey, no, i was just go actually ahead, going to direct Krista. it to the next person <laughs> um i would say that um a lot of people are sort of wondering like if they can only have one support person so sometimes it's it's not even an issue of like can i have a doula per se it's like i can have someone with me um do i have my partner do i have my doula like what makes sense to to choose and that of course is a personal personal decision to make and i think for people who have other kiddos that play into the picture right that that might mean having a partner stay home with the other kids and, and having your doula if that's possible. And if it's not possible, having a doula virtually um, certainly is, is better than not having support. Um, so I think everyone's situation is so unique and um, there are answers for each of those situations to, to navigate. So have you had some uh, iPad support sessions? Um, here, we, I haven't had an issue in terms of going in. I've still been able to go in and support my clients. Um, in terms of prenatal and postpartum care, certainly um, virtual support is absolutely an option. And depending on the person, if they, if they feel comfortable with me coming into their homes based on the other precautions that I'm taking, um, that's a possibility too. Or dropping off provisions even, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of things, just that education and support piece that, that is so important. How about you, Darcy? What, what, what have you? <clears throat> yeah, I'll say I'm a postpartum doula, but I'll, what I'll say about birth is I think, as Taylor said, you know, something birth doulas offer and it can be virtually is the prenatal support and education you know learning as much as you can about pain management coping skills and then even also like questions and choices that you might face during birth you know if you can educate yourself as much as you can beforehand whether that's working with your doula virtually reading books um, I'm a prenatal yoga teacher, so I think even just taking some prenatal yoga class, learning those breathing techniques and other coping skills are really, imp they're always important, but especially important now. And then once baby's here, I have really been pleasantly surprised at how great virtual postpartum doula support can be. You know, when this all first happened, uh, you know, I had done virtual consults before, but it was really when a mom had some very specific questions. So I thought, you know, how is this going to look? Like when I'm in someone's home, I'm showing them how to swaddle their baby. I'm emptying their dishwasher. I'm, you know, doing, it's all hands-on support, but um, it's really not. So I'm spending hours on the phone with new moms because you have a bazillion questions once you're home with your new baby that you realize you are completely in charge of you have approximately one bazillion questions so that's what we can <laughs> postpartum doulas can answer via zoom like this and then um it's really i've done lactation 
consults that have been very successful via Zoom. Like with your iPhone, you can, you know, zoom things around. People are texting me pictures of umbilical cord stumps. Like, does this look normal? <laughs> like, so you can really get a lot of the support that you need um, doing virtual visits. One thing I also want to add is, um, again, planning and, you know, setting people up to drop off food, like Alicia said, and other supplies on your front porch. Um, also, I've had, and I know someone wrote in on my Facebook page or sent me an email, they're expecting twins. I've worked with two other families expecting twins right now. And what they did was have, um, one had her mom, one had her sister self isolate for 14 days in their own home. And the parents, you know, the expecting family did the same thing. And then that support person came and just moved in. So if you have an unemployed sister right now, or your mom is healthy, you know, someone you trust and love and is willing to move in with you, you know, self-isolate for whatever the time period is, and then come stay with you. That, I mean, is ideal, especially with twins. I mean, you need hands-on support. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Yeah, that's just not fair. I know. I know. <laughs> and I feel like there's this twin boom right now for some reason. <laughs> There, there definitely is. And, and I'll just follow up to what the other doulas have said as well. And, and I think what a, a huge component of doula support in general, but particularly during this pandemic is the need for emotional processing. You know, it, it, we're all stressed. We're all coming up against, you know, challenges that um, are beyond what typical challenges may have been. And so having a doula who's an objective, educated professional who who knows the period of time, um, who can help to, again, just be a safe space and give really concrete, tangible techniques, coping skills, tools, not just for, um, it, it, there's just, there's so many different ways that, that that takes form. And so I think that's another really important part of the, the work that we all do. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that, that, actually having us be in this position, it's made, I think, medicine and healthcare in general realize that virtual appointments and support is potentially something that could have, should have been, could have been used a lot more um, in the old world, and it wasn't. And so I, I think new world, post-COVID going forward, I think that's going to stay. I think why not why not make it more convenient? Why not limit contact? Why, why do the whole rigmarole to get somebody out of the house when they don't have to and if the support can be there? So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's a change that, that sticks around the, at least as, as a hybrid uh, virtual component to for really from here on out. Yeah, I think that's one of the silver linings that's coming out of this is, is particularly, you know, as Krista mentioned, the emotional pull this is having on everybody and especially new moms like to be able to do a virtual counseling session with a counselor and not have to pack your new baby up and drive somewhere and wait in the waiting room and figure out how you're going to feed them like that it's it's amazing game changer right so right. i think you're right i think that's one of the things moving forward yeah and then also back to doulas that's another huge part of what doulas do. I've, I've been doing a lot of just listening to birth, you know, birth stories, helping moms process what, and the, process their birth and, you know, everything that happens. And then also just mourning what they're losing. You know, moms are sad about lose, not having a baby shower and not having people be able to visit the baby in the hospital and things like that. So that's another big thing that we can, birth doulas and postpartum doulas can help with. Is just yeah. a listening ear, non judgmental support. So that's great. I think that the support is definitely still available. It might look a little different. It might not be the hug that everybody needs, but um, it's, it's, there's a lot of virtual uh, abilities. Um, Morgan, I would love to hear what you have to say about that, because another question we have really is what, what about access to care for mom? Um, after what if we can't attend the checkup what what you know how does that care transition and how does that look yeah so um, I mean community midwifery and home birth care is 
is so different than uh, like a hospital-based care. So for us, it looks a little bit different in that um, typically we see parents and babies five to eight times in their postpartum period. And that's a really important component to midwifery care. I feel like we spend so long creating this relationship and they, um, they trust us uh, to care for their babies and um, taking that away doesn't feel great. Um, but there are, you know, appointments that three weeks, appoint, three week appointments that maybe not may not be essential. So I've done a few postpartum visits where moms are weighing their babies and dads are measuring, you know, the heads. And so that's a, a piece that's nice that involves parents in a way that um, they may not have experienced before, even though we're always encouraging families to sort of be hands-on, especially in a home setting. Um, we come in and it's an appointment's appointment and a healthcare provider is still a healthcare provider. So there have been ups and downs um, as far as virtual support and what that looks like. Um, but does that answer your question? I think I got it. Yeah, I mean, I th and I think it <laughs> sounds like it's, it's different too, based on who your support network is. If you have a more traditional model versus a community versus, you know, and versus each one of you offer kind of a different. Right, right, right. And it is so, and on that, that piece, it's so different where our client load is so much lower than, you know, an OB's office who, who they're seeing several babies in a week, whereas I may only see one or two. So that exposure rate is certainly different. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's all different. I think that um, just having any support in the postpartum is, is super important. I have a lot of people, everybody's handling it very differently. Some people are really embracing the um, alone time and really finding that uh, I read a beautiful post about somebody who had two children at home and they could only have their partner. So uh, I guess their mother watched their children and, and she said, you know, it would, it would have never had just been me and my partner having a baby, you know, uninterrupted. It would have been, she, you know, they got this 24 hour period of just her and her partner and their new baby. And um, she was very fearful and felt like that was an opportunity that they had because of this that they wouldn't have had before. Um, and I feel like moms are, you know, resting a little bit more. Um, there are less visits, there are less people popping by. Um, and so that's, that's a good thing. But I, I also feel like, you know, coming from uh, a practice where my passion is building relationships with these people, it, it it's very different. It's very different. It's very different to meet with somebody this way um, and have a conversation and look at a belly button and not be able to put my hands on that belly or those babies. Are you all finding that you're figuring out different strategies to accomplish similar goals? Like if our initial instinct would be to sort of feel and put their put our hands to to navigate that are are you all finding that you're you know okay let me see this or you're guiding the clients to to help you gather that information it's been actually something that i've found has been really um again kind of one of those silver lining things where because so much of the the virtual support down now is much more talk oriented, right? And whereas sometimes in home as a postpartum dual, again, it can sometimes be a bit more task oriented because that's really needed. Um, I have really had a lot of great feedback from the clients that I'm working with about how nice it is to have again that that verbal <laughs> check in and really uh, like a space to to think and to kind of come up with, oh, right, these are my questions. And it becomes a little bit more uh, succinct in, in a way. Um, and so in terms of the strategies and navigating that, it does look a little bit different. Um, again, just because what we typically would have done would be more hands-on. But um, there are, I think, quite a few um, 
strategies that we have already always put in place and we just may be relying more heavily on them now. I know I have um, quite a bit too, even on those early times where I might have in my head had a checklist and things that I'm kind of going over as I'm talking and there might be 10 other pieces that I'm, I'm kind of navigating through that I might not be verbalizing, but by verbalizing it, I'm actually finding that it's drawing more attention to that. For example, a, a scar where maybe I would have felt and, and looked and, and, and spoken about it, um, but the detail with which I'm having to explain or having them touch and move to, to gather that information, it's actually quite helpful for them to be in their own bodies and to, to figure that out themselves. Um, and so I think that's, uh, a silver lining that I'm finding that maybe that that education and me navigating or me helping somebody navigate their own body versus me making that decision of what's worth bringing to their attention has has been really interesting. Yeah, I've noticed the same, especially with breastfeeding, you know, like I can't go and weigh the baby every three days or they, you know, you can't go to the pediatrician as much you can, but they're not having you go as much. So it's, you know, teaching parents more cues and tools to judge, you know, whether baby's getting enough, like learning more about counting peas and poopy diapers and watching for certain cues. And it, like you said, it's, it's actually really more empowering to them. And um, it is, it, it, again, it's just amazing what we can accomplish virtually. And we're always sort of, um, well, we're not, but maybe we are, but we're always really encouraging autonomy, right? And, and I think that that piece of what's happening here is really um, guided autonomy, if that sounds like a fair word, yeah. but it's sort of like saying, here, here's your opportunity to, you know, measure your own baby, feel your own baby's belly button tell me what it looks like you know yes send me a picture but also describe to me like what it's feeling like and that that piece like it's such a relationship building piece and a bonding piece that I think is is wonderful something else that I you just kind of reminded me of Morgan as well is um I you know especially as doulas we're we're full family care right and so you know having um an opportunity again for many families to be home with one another, um, you know, as as challenging as that can be, sometimes it's also. I think many people are using this as um, a way of redeveloping their relationships. And I think that again, as professionals in our various capacities, um, we can we can really lean on those relationships and help them to facilitate again good communication and um, and really kind of a, a coming back to one another, um, especially in these changes with pregnancy and postpartum where things can feel really tumultuous. And so it's nice to, to again, um, have an opportunity where who might not necessarily be available for appointments and, um, and time home once baby is born uh, to have that time and then to be able to work with them uh, perhaps more than we might otherwise have an ability to has been nice. And I just want to say kind of the other side of the silver lining is that if you something in your gut is telling you something's off or you have real big questions, like call your provider, go see your provider. Like I talk, I think this is a common feeling and pre COVID, like you don't want to bother anybody. Um, but, and now people are like, well, I don't want to, you know, go to the hospital. I don't want to go to, into the doctor because I don't want to take care away from COVID patients. Like, you have to reach out if you're worried about something like call, just call, talk to a nurse, talk to the, you know, they'll put you through the doctor, like reach out, don't stay home or don't, don't not reach out when you have a mm -hmm. big concern. I think that that is one fear-based um, uh, sort of reaction of this where it's, it's like, if you go near the hospital, you're going to get COVID. Um, you know, they are making every, uh, you know, um, change they can make at the hospital, especially for the OBs and to, and, and pediatricians to really 
um, n there's no like, cr they're not like in the ICU treating COVID patients and then they're doing, you know, their day job. Like that's not how it's, it is. So, you know, the, the relative risk for you to go in when you need it is really still very low. And so when you need it, um, the the what could happen with with an infection or or something else is is really quite a great risk and so definitely that's I think that's a great point like reach out and like go talk to your provider or or go um, I think that's a, a good segue to to the 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 next question that I'm I'm seeing a lot of is um, side of my soapbox is like what about the mom what about the birthing person is um, the, the healing. And I think that same fear is like, well, if I can't go into any of my checkups, well, that, that's a, a possible. I mean, you should, there, there's, it's maybe not excessive like Morgan was saying, and that, that's not excessive. That is actually a great plan. But now it's, it's in this world limiting the contact. But what is the new plan now? Like, how do you, how do you make sure that your body is physically healing and what are the next steps? Um, Annie, do you have uh, any any thoughts on uh, the physical healing? There is a lot um, that goes into the physical healing in the first six weeks, for sure. Um, and I know some of the doulas can speak to that as well. Um, but really, as far as pelvic floor healing within the first six weeks, um, and Morgan, you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here, but um, you're looking for that wound internally, right? To make sure that the, where the placenta has detached from the uterus is healed. And I think that is the start of where um, the all clear or like, you're fine, you can do whatever you want. Um, that's where that starts. And it's kind of been amplified into like, you should be healed by now. And, you know, everyone in this birth panel agrees, like you're not healed by six weeks. Um, you're not, you're, you're just starting down your healing journey. Um, physically, our tissues take longer to repair. Um, our hormones are just all over the place. Our sleep schedule is all over the place. And if we just think of things in a simple, simple manner, I mean, it took nine months to grow a baby. Why would it take anything less than nine months to recover from having a baby? So the pelvic floor takes time to recover. Um, if you've had tears or um, it, uh, any prolapse or any episiotomy or anything like that, like that, that takes time. And we need to start respecting our bodies when they ask for that time. Um, too often our brains go into high gear mode. And I think that um, that's another silver lining of this COVID-19 slowdown is hopefully our, our brains are starting to disengage a little bit from the, from the external high gear um, mode, but physical healing and you know, emotional healing goes into that too. A lot of times we see um, unresolved emotions from the birth um, held in the tissues in the body. So um, cesarean scars are a great example of that. Um, but even pelvic floor clenching, and there's a lot of fear around birth now, unfortunately. And then let's double down on that because we're in a pandemic. So Give yourself time for physical healing. It's not six weeks. There isn't a number. Mine is different than every other woman's on this panel as far as what our normal healing times are. And even within like your normal healing time from your first baby to your second, it's different. You just have to respect the body. But generally speaking, you know, you're, you're safe to insert things into your vagina if you wish at six weeks. Around the three month mark, we start to wish. see another shift. If you wish. If you wish, <laughs> there's no requirement there. But honestly, if things, uh, you know, if you, if you aren't feeling like things are right, like if you are afraid to put a tampon in or have sex, you know, pelvic PT is an emerging in emerging field. I mean, it's been around a while, but we're just gaining uh, visibility, I think, and painful intercourse, painful anything, really. Um, and helping to heal and find your pelvic floor again so that you can start to build back that core strength is, is imperative. And, you know, we get a lot of questions like, when am I physically ready to return to running, CrossFit, yoga, bar, 
whatever you do to help you feel like your normal you. And um, the answer is the worst one ever. It depends. And um, I think it was Anthony Lowe. He had a great quote out there and he said, your body is a team and you need to go at the pace of the slowest player. So your brain wants to get back ASAP, but maybe your abdominals are still kind of figuring out what happened when they were stretched like this and now they're deflated like this and they're supposed to do their job somehow. Um, so you have to respect your recovery time or else you're just setting yourself up for a higher risk of injury. Not guaranteed. We can, get away, we can get away with a lot of things. We're very resilient and adaptive creatures. But um, yeah, go at the pace of your slowest player and love your body. And Annie, can, yeah, oh, go ahead, Taylor. Can I ask you a follow-up question to that for either Annie or Kristen, probably? I've worked with families who, um, and this isn't COVID-related, but it's postpartum related, who like the the pregnant person knows that their one of their main strategies for dealing with stress is exercise is like really getting those endorphins firing mm -hmm. and i've worked with some families who are worried about because we talk about like self-regulation during the postpartum time period how to take care of yourself when you're dealing with a fussy baby how to manage stress and so what would you say to people who are like well my main way of doing it is very active exercise so what could i do during those early postpartum weeks when that's not possible. Absolutely. Um, and we hear that from, from women a lot anyway. And some of that, you know, that we're finding in this, this modern American woman culture of like, do all the things, be all the things, and also like Pinterest, that birthday cake, um, is that we're on overdrive. And the way that we shed that excess energy is through running or hit or, you know, cardio like intensity and we're just kind of perpetuating this cycle of running on sympathetic overdrive so our sympathetic system is the one that's our fight flight or freeze um, and yes like getting those endorphins rushing it feels good we get this hit of, of good feeling stuff but we're perpetuating this high um, frequency kind of um, cycle and so what I challenge every person to do that says that to me like even we can take this out of postpartum. I broke my ankle. Now I can't do my stress reliever. Right. Um, I really challenge that person to go inside and like, take a look at what that means. And if they're resistant to switching it up, like you could do meditation, you could do breath work, you could do maybe some gentle mat exercises. You could take walks, you could journal. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of other things that you can do to get that system to calm and shed that excess ner nervous energy. And if you're resistant to that, oh, I'm not a meditator, or, oh no, no, running is the only thing that oh, I can do. Let's step back from that and see why are we resistant to that change? Because here's the thing, postpartum change occurs, period, end of sentence. You're not immune to it. Change is going to happen to you and your body and your life. So if we can proactively kind of look ahead into that change. And if you discover whenever you're five months pregnant and you're like, oh, I, don't, I can't give up my, my running or something, um, let's discover that, you know, that self-limiting belief there and try some stuff out. Open your mind. Maybe meditation is great. Maybe guided walks are great. Um, and just do what, you, do what you can. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to do. But also it's a short period of time. And I've told my moms, I've told my athletes, I've told all of my patients this throughout my entire career of like, if you just, you know, if you give it two weeks for like an ankle sprain, like if you stop and actively heal, you're ahead of the game. Even though it feels like you are sitting here doing nothing, your body is actively repairing. It takes, let's take it back to biology class. Like it takes cellular energy to regrow tissues remember all that, like ATP and stuff like that. So that is biological energy that the rest of your system doesn't get to use. But what we do is we sit here and we beat ourselves up for saying, oh, I'm so tired. I haven't even done anything. Like, why do I, why do I suck? You know, I'm just the worst and I'm fat and I don't know how to care for this baby. I mean, it's just, we can, we are just, oh, we're so mean up here. Um, so really getting into the mental side of, you know, in what other ways can I relieve my stress? Because this way is going to change. 
and we have to, we're either going to get like eased into that or slammed into that. I love that. Thank you. Like what a great reframe too. And what a great opportunity for finding other tools, right? Like I think becoming a parent and parenting asks us to be really, really resilient and flexible and change course. So it's a great way or a great time to develop some other tools and know that you can also go back to your exercise, but then you'll have all of these other things too. Exactly. It's always there I think that you. um I think that's why um support before you deliver is so important because it's not like you can say, hey, this is gonna happen and here's this worksheet, you know, pay attention to this like day two after delivery. Um, but also to just have that conversation to say who like what are your expectations and beliefs of this time period and and to address that and you know if a if a runner like look you shouldn't be running like in the story but um if like what drives you is it the solitude that you need um mm-hmm. it's it's any habit change and it's the same thing we do when if if somebody's a coffee drinker and it makes them leap so they're like i'm not giving up my coffee that's cool like that's not like i'm just telling you that that's a big factor so let's talk about like the yumminess of that habit like what makes you um, you know, what makes that the thing that you're not giving up. And it's, it's, it's not the coffee, it's, it's the experience usually. And so it's, it's the experience so that we try to help reframe the, the experience so that they're, they're being filled up in that way. Um, but even that awareness that like, Hey, I run for a lot of reasons, not just, um, for the reasons we necessarily talk about it being Mm -hmm. for. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to follow up on some of this as well. I, I, I spend so much of my time walking around with my hands saying like, here's the expectation and here's my reality. And it almost never matches up. Right. And especially again, when we're in these changing times with pregnancy, with adding new babies to the family, and then on top of that, having a pandemic. And so additionally between like, it's that that tension, right? Of like, okay, well, how do I manage that? What are some of those coping skills, right? Because it almost never matches up. And something else I say very frequently is parenthood breaks you, right? But in kind of the best way possible. And so it kind of has an opportunity to break you open and help you to reprioritize and help you again as an opportunity to say, what do you want your life to be like? Not only for yourself, but what do you want your children to have and to experience? And I, again, think um, as challenging as, as this period of time in history is, Um, It is an opportunity for reprioritizing. And I think people are really experiencing that and seeing that and really recognizing the supports that they do need and where they want to place that value. And, um, and just knowing again, that, that there is opportunity to do that and people who want to support to, to help people reach that ideal and that expectation. That's my favorite quote. I think that I say all the time, lower your expectations mm-hmm. and you will feel successful. 100%. Um, you know, um, so we have a question that came in about um, there are some, uh, somebody was, it was recommended that they just get an IUD in the hospital upon delivery to save a visit um, coming back and um, they would like you all to weigh in on your opinion on that. <laughs> Morgan? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> Sorry, it's muted. Um, what? Um, <laughs> an IUD like immediately postpartum? Is that like that's, within that's, the forty-eight hours before they leave the hospital? That is that what the is, recommendation was? It, I'm clear on that. Yes, um, my midwife is recommending I get an IUD postpartum while I'm still in the hospital to re- reduce non-emergent procedures. Oh, your body's doing so much healing. Um, I can't imagine that that would be a safe option. Um, an IUD is, uh, you know, depending on the type. So, you know, there are two different types. There's a hormonal-based IUD or a copper-based IUD. Uh, you're introducing something into the uterus. So up through the cervix, um, you're, as Annie had mentioned before, when your placenta releases from the uterine wall, it leaves an open wound essentially, which is why we bleed for so long in our postpartum period. Um, I, I, 
myself, I have, I have an IUD personally, which is probably too much information, but uh, you know, it's an irritant. The whole, the whole way that it works is that it's an irritant and it basically makes a non-viable place to have um, an embryo grow. So to introduce that in a postpartum healing situation is uh, something I wouldn't consider ever. And on top of that, you know, just to follow up with the hormonal component, especially in terms of mm -hmm. breastfeeding, that can be a huge factor in terms of disrupting the cycle of breast milk production and release. And so in those first 12 weeks postpartum in particular, that's when someone is developing their long-term milk supply. And so even at six weeks, I usually have a conversation with families who are breastfeeding and who want to maintain that relationship about what are your different options and make sure you speak with your provider and so to um, introduce especially a hormonal component of things so early on um, could very, very much disrupt uh, breastfeeding success. Mm. And, and even without the hormonal component, right, because the copper IUD essentially tricks your body into believing it's pregnant. So if um, your body thinks that it's pregnant because you have something in the uterus, you're not going to have a good milk production uh, until that, that, that component is removed because you're already pregnant again in your body's physiological process. And I think this, like this question, I think perfectly highlights what can happen when we're experiencing a situation where there's so much fear. Like I, I really have a lot of empathy and understanding mm -hmm. for somebody who's being given this advice and being taken by a care provider into this place of intense fear, like that it would be so incredibly dangerous to go into their office at, you know, 12 weeks postpartum or whatever and get that IUD placed. Um, I think we see, you know, unfortunately, a lot of like fearful, fear-based reactions in healthcare that aren't evidence-based because everyone is afraid. And so I think just remembering like one of my, I think one of the doula superpowers that we have, especially birth doulas, is to help people ask really good questions, help people mm -hmm. slow it down and make sure that they're really getting evidence-based information and that they're really taking the time to reflect on what they're being told and process with their support people and think about what feels best to them. So, I mean, whoever brought this question to us, I think it's wonderful mm -hmm. that you, that you brought yeah. it up and that you're doing your own research and trying to really figure out what's best for you. Yeah. And I always ask why, why would I need an IUD? Is it for birth control? Um, is it to manage, you know, symptoms of my endometriosis or something like that mm -hmm. but why why are we recommending hormonal birth control because you know what else prevents pregnancy is condoms you know that's that is a completely non-invasive non non-invasive to our bodies and it prevents pregnancy so if pregnancy prevention is your goal there's other methods what know? are the alternatives yeah. yeah like what else what else can i do and yeah you know, back to well, and I think that's when the, the support to have somebody looking out for you to say what like what are your goals here and mm -hmm. let's look mm -hmm. at the whole picture. Um, and I think that's probably what initiated all of your professions because of the the lack of that happening, um, and the 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 need the deep need that that exists for every person. I mean, listening to you all, I. I'm not going to, but I feel like I could have another baby and it might be a good experience this time. I'm like, we got you. <laughs> Old lady having a baby. <laughs> um, and I think the cool thing is too, that a lot of what we do, probably all of us in our different professions is, I know that most people actually have it within them to know what the right choice is. Mm -hmm. And we get to kind of pull that out and reflect it back to you. Um, because there's so many voices telling you you should do so many different things and it's hard to hear what your own voice says, but it's there. And that's a lot of what I think we all do for people. And that's, I think that, sorry, I don't know if you can see the comment on the YouTube, but her next oh. comment is, um, I'm leaning towards no because of infections, trauma, and hormones. Mm -hmm. what are your yeah. thoughts? So just like you said, Taylor, like she, she knows. She knows her body, mm -hmm. but we're bombarding her with insecurity and fear and power-based decisions. Do it my way. It's the easiest way for me. Yeah. No, like, sh sh listen, listen here. 
And there's a great acronym that I know many of us as, as perinatal professionals use is BRAIN. So asking things like, what are the benefits? What are the risks? What is your intuition? Or sorry, alternatives. What's your intuition? And is it necessary? Or does it need to happen now? Right. And so going through that brain acronym, this can be applied in almost any scenario, not just for pregnant and postpartum parents, but uh, for everyone. And Everything. sometimes and just like taking a few minutes to go through that helps to empower you because it can be really hard to listen to that intuition when we have so many other factors around us. Um, and so kind of getting to a bit of a quiet place and, and going through that, even in emergent situations, there's usually enough time. And that can help, again, to make someone feel like it's their choice versus something being done to them. And I think this is a huge point postpartum once your baby's here and you're, you know, I was, I, I was sitting personally sitting around waiting for my mother's intuition to kick in. And I was like, where is it? I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I think, you know, as a doula, postpartum doula now, that's a huge thing that I offer. Like, let's weigh the options. What are you thinking about this? What's your gut saying? And reassuring mom as she's going through the decision process, like, yeah, that's a great gut instinct that you're having about your baby. And P.S., you're the world's leading expert on your baby, even though your baby's two days old, but you know your baby better than anyone. You've spent more time. So I think it's important to remember as you're having a baby now in you know, more isolation than ever that you do have really strong maternal instincts, even if you don't think that you do. And it's really important to listen to that little voice in your head and that little voice in your gut that's telling you something. And you know, ask, ask if you don't have a postpartum doula, ask your friends, call your provider, call a different provider if you don't like that provider's answer. Like, talk it out with a lot of people. And then I always say, and then average it out and settle on the answer that sits well in your gut. And um, I think it's especially important now to really honor that. Alicia, I know you unmuted. You wanted to hop in? I was, I was going to say that we've been conditioned from such a young age to, to not rely on our instincts and our intuition. Um, and as Taylor and Krista and, and Darcy said, you know, a lot of our work as doulas is reminding people that they have that and should rely on it more often. And, um, I think we're also, you know, Krista, you were talking about expectations and reality, and we are also conditioned to have like a for things to be predictable. Like our our culture loves predictability and like feeling in control, and that's not what birth is outside of a pandemic. That's not what parenting is outside of a pandemic. Um, so I think it's a lot of this work is like returning to those those instincts and intuition and being adaptable and and all of those things which are sort of heightened right now right like you have to really dig deep and and look for those things that's awesome i i think this is such a such an amazing group i'm i'm so excited to to see everybody together so i think in wrapping up i'll i'll, I'll just let everybody highlight um you know, how people can connect with you and um, if you have anything going on. And, you know, I think that all of us, what is it, April, end of April, May and June, it's a diff each one of those months are probably going to be a different world. And so I, I, I know that we are all ear to the ground, kind of like, what do you all need? And so what I would suggest, I can speak for everyone, is just reach out and ask us because mm -hmm. we are all looking to help um, we are helpers, and so um, just just ask, and and I'm sure we will have someone or know someone with the answer that can help you. So um, so Taylor, why don't why don't you start and just kind of wrap up and tell us what's going on with you? Sure, thanks. Yeah, I am still showing up as a doula. So I. Um, my brother-in-law was supposed to get married at the end of May and he's not, I mean, they're just postponing it. So I've already grabbed two more clients coming up this month. So I'm still available to show up in, you know, at least at Wentworth Douglas for people who are local. 
And for folks who are not I'm able to support you virtually, um, also doing lots of just birth planning sessions online. So just hopping on Zoom with folks and helping them plan for whatever they need. A lot of postpartum planning I've been doing too, which has been really fun. So that's kind of, that's me. I'm doing it and I'm here to support people. And also just, yeah, reach out to me if you need something, even if you don't think I'm the person who can help you, because I think that's a lot of what all of us can do um, is connect you to the person who can. And you have a great cool. podcast. Oh. Yeah, I was oh, going to say, like, yeah, where um, to reach you. Yeah, so how to reach me. Yeah, so Darcy and I do have a podcast that we just um, put an episode out on all about this, kind of birth and postpartum podcast. in the pandemic. Thank you so much. Um, and you can just reach me if you want. You can just find me on my website, tayloredavisdoula.com. There's a contact page there that comes right to my email. Um, and I'm pretty busy on Instagram at tayloredavisdoula. So you can also just message me there. All right, awesome. And how about Morgan? Uh, but yeah, sorry. That was <laughs> um, you can always reach out to me. So my, um, my philosophy is education and I love talking with parents about their options. Um, so, and I also want to encourage people that just because you feel more comfortable in a hospital, um, does not mean that you can't reach out to me and say, Hey, you know, my OB recommended this. What are your thoughts? I'm really, truly, honestly happy to answer those um, questions and sort of weigh out the options. Um, I love research and information. So if you're looking for it, um, you probably will get more than you would like. Um, so please feel free. My website um, is flourishmidwifery.com. It's pretty easy. My contact page um, or Facebook Messenger, whatever. Yeah. Right. I'm going down my Brady Bunch squares here, so this might make not make sense to other people, but uh, Darcy's next on my panel. All right. So um, the probably easiest way to contact me is through my website, doverdoula.com. I offer virtual postpartum doula support right now. I also have a great online class um, called Yoga for Birth, which um, I was mentioning that it's a great tool for um, you and your partner to learn yoga poses and breathing techniques that will keep you calm during labor and help um, open your body up and actually help make labor progress faster. And partners really love this class because they learn tactical hands-on ways to support like early labor, do this active stage, do this. So it's really um, great. And that, and as silver lining is now like you can bring it on your iPad and kind of watch through the poses. Um, so you can find that on my website. You can, email me, uh, same thing, birth nerd. I love talking about it all. So just <laughs> hit me with your questions. Um, I host the podcast with Taylor. I feel like there's one more thing, but that's it. Doverdoula.com. I just right. sent your class to one of my clients. They're super oh, awesome. excited about it. Yeah. Yay. And uh, Alicia? Yes. Um, so you can find me or contact me through my website, birthstrongdoula.com. Um, I also work with Morgan, so happy to be a resource alongside her and um, Megan James, who was not here tonight. I'm sorry, Megan um, from Small Batch Wellness. Um, we offer some virtual postpartum support as well. And um, yeah, please feel free to reach out for, for anything. You know, I think in this area, particularly, you can still have your doula at the hospital with you. So, um, All right. so have one. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and Krista? Um, so the, probably the easiest way to, um, contact me directly would be Krista at reliefparenting.com. Um, uh, my website's reliefparenting.com and I've been doing a lot of, um, breastfeeding consultations virtually, a lot of, uh, postpartum doula support virtually and parenting consultations because my background is in, um, family studies and early childhood development and family dynamics. So, Right now, with a lot of people being home, trying to navigate through all of the dynamics of parenting, I spend a lot of time doing consultations and getting um, some, some strategies and coping uh, things for families right now. So those are some of the various things people can do. Um, and again, lots of 
so I'm always so happy to just be able to be someone to listen to and give resources for. So um, yeah, contact me anytime. Yeah, use us. And so I, um, Oceanside Physical Therapy is going to start seeing people in person on a limited basis in mid-May and working up into June. We're just going to start to do a tiered approach, but also doing that when we feel like it's necessary and doing virtual appointments really um, as much as we can. So it's going to be a hybrid approach. Um, you know, we have taken this time um, and tried to support those who did not feel supported as, as in this group, but we still have the whole, the, the navigation um, uh, panel is going, is, is free. So share it, um, watch it. I, mm -hmm. I know it's hard to get through. There's a ton of information on there um, and, and use it as a resource um, at Oceanside, at our site, oceansidephysicaltherapy.com. I, one thing I was hearing from people is that exercise and uh, att um, attending to themselves was very overwhelming and an exercise program or, or what, you know, even the modules, it just seemed like so much information. So I developed a, a 14 day kind of like my biggest highlights of like two minute videos, like two minutes. I, I you know, if, if 10 minutes was too much, 30 minutes was too much, I pared it down to like the highlights. And so I really, I developed this short little two week free program just to really be the high points to just feel good, know that you're doing, it's really easy strategies to start connecting with your body again. Um, you know, there, I would exercise is a strong word. They're really like ways to be aware and to move your body in certain ways that you'll just shift and you start to, activate certain things that have been on vacation for a while and, and kind of um, make things chill out that have been maybe doing a lot of the work. So I know that's what we have our site on our site. Um, we are see, seeing some people um, doing virtual consults. Um, and of course, we're here as a network as well. Does anybody, anybody, did we miss anything? Um, our Facebook group that goes along with the um, information yes. series. So that's a great way to reach all of us, actually. Yes. Um, and, you know, um, because we put this together pretty darn fast, I think that this uh, will be evolving as well. So just, just again, reach out and be on the lookout for any tweaks that, um, you know, we want to hear from you all as well. We really are interested to hear what you need. And also, um, I think using each other as a support group could be very beneficial. So, um, you know, um, a lot of us have had babies, but um, none of us have had babies during COVID. So you're your own special, special support group. So um, we can, we can help, but we can't truly um, be a peer in, in all of this. So, um, so uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody ever. This is like panel of superstars. I love it. Um, Everybody have a great night and reach out um, and happy parenting and birthing to you all. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. Thanks so much for watching that video. Please hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see more of those videos and keep learning on how to read your body. Have a great day.